I think that ultimately the answer to that question goes back to two fundamental truths that you and I need to have dead center of our lives and very clear in our minds. A particular one, uh, a truth that's absolutely essential to who God is and a truth that's absolutely essential to who you and I are. So a truth about God and a truth about us as human beings. I think if we get these two truths clear, we will know why love is always at the center for Jesus, for Paul, for Augustine, and for any other Christian that gets clear on the kingdom. First, the truth about God, because it always starts with God at the center. Right? Here's the truth. It's a little statement that comes in 1 John 4, 8. Interestingly, it's repeated eight verses later in verse 16 of 1 John 4. And it simply in the Greek says this, Hotheos agape esten. And we would translate that into English as God is agape. Why love? Why love at the center? John tells us because this love, and it's a particular kind of love, agape. We'll be getting in another session into a little bit deeper what is unique about agape compared to other loves. But it's the word here that used for love. God is agape. How is it that God can be love, right? What this text is not saying, this text isn't simply saying that God loves, though that's true. But this text is not saying God loves. This text is saying God is love. Not something that God just does. It's the essence of who God is. And I think that is a stunning statement. So here's the thing. For a human being, I could never say that I am love, right? I might say I'm loving when I, uh, you know, think of my wife, Kelly. Uh, I, 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 I just cannot help but feel a sense of love and, and connection to her. And I, I can say, Kelly and I have a loving relationship. She loves me and I love her. But neither of us could ever say we are our love. What is it about God that makes sense out of the statement that he is love? Well, here's the thing. For someone to be love, what is love? Love requires at least a lover and a beloved, right? One who's doing loving and one who's being loved. And hopefully it's reciprocal so that although one is doing the loving and one is being loved, this person also is doing the loving and this person is also being loved. So there's a reciprocality to the lover-beloved relationship. But notice, for love to be, it requires at least two persons. One who's loving, one who's being loved, who's also loving, the other one being loved. A, a loving dance of relationship. Why is God love? We're back to the mystery of the Trinity here, right? This unique teaching that no other religion on planet Earth has ever claimed about God. We have some religions that have multiple gods, polytheism. We have other religions that are monotheist, have one God, which Christians would agree with, but their God is simply one person. Christianity is the only religion that's ever claimed that at the center of the universe of reality, that the, the eternal creator at the heart of God is an eternal loving relationship of persons. Father loving Son, Son loving Spirit, Spirit loving Father, in an eternal dance through all of, of our life and God's life, which is eternal. That the heart of reality is an eternal love relationship. That's how John can say God is love. Love is not something God just does. Love is something God is. Now, because he is love, of course, his heart towards all things is love. That's why I think Jesus goes for love at the center, because God's at the center of all things. And at the center of God is love relationship. That's the truth about God. What does that mean for us now? Well, let's go back to another important text. First chapter of the first book of our Bibles. Genesis chapter 1. In fact, the verses I'm going to read, verses 26 and 27, are the first time that in the scripture we hear God say the word human. So this is God's first thought when he thinks human being. 
Then God said, Let us create humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. An amazing text. A text that tells us that when God first thought human being, God thought my image. I think what we have here is our job description. Our job description number one. That whatever else we do in life, whatever profession we might end up with, whatever uh, relationships we might have, marriage or friendship or church, that whatever else happens in planet Earth, with your life or my life, that at the heart of our identity, our very job description, our, our purpose for being, is to image this God who is triune love. Let me say for a minute a, a few words about what the idea of imaging a God. See, there's been a lot of debate through the centuries, Christians debating or discussing. Uh, so what is it about us that images God, right? But before we ask that question, I think we have to, have to ask a prior question, and it's this. What is an image of a God? Well, there's a pretty clear answer to that in the ancient world. In the ancient world, uh, all over the ancient Near East, kind of like the context of, of the Old Testament, uh, and then on into the Greco-Roman period, context of our New Testament, the idea of, of an image of a God was a common cultural idea. Usually it meant one of two things. An image of a God was either, first, a statue in a temple that uh, polytheistic religions, pagans who worship many gods, would come to their temples and in them they would find these images that some, um, someone had, had created representing a particular god and they would literally worship before these, these uh, statues, what we would call idols. So the first thing that in the ancient world was known as an image of a god was what we refer to in the Bible and in our culture today as, as an idol. Now, interestingly, uh, we need to know how they thought about idols or images, it's the same thing, so that we understand what God means when he says he's going to create his own image, right? So in the ancient world, here's how an, an idol or an image, uh, a stone statue w was created. Ancient people believed that when their god that they were going to worship needed an image to go in their temple, they believed that their god, a spirit being, would actually communicate to the craftsman who was going to make this thing. Um, the craftsman would, would spend time praying and meditating until they got a sense that they believe was coming right from this god, the spirit being, of how to make this thing, how big it should be, uh, the dimensions, the materials it should, should be used in making it, all detailed information. They believed they were simply receiving the instructions, that the, the spirit was downloading loading the blueprint for, for this particular image. And once they sensed that they had it, they would begin to construct this thing. Now typically, uh, the, the core of it was, was a wooden uh, image, and overlaid was precious metals and sometimes jewels. In the end, you'd have a very valuable uh, statue. It wasn't done yet, though. They believed that before it could become a real image, because at this point it's just a, a valuable piece of wood and metal and jewels, before it could be an image, there'd be this ritual that had to be done. Uh, in one culture, it was called the mouthwashing ritual. They would literally have the priests of their temple now come and pray around this image. And as they prayed, they would do the mouthwashing ceremony where a, a uh, sacred rag was taken and water was used to mouth, wash the mouth of this, this statue. And as the prayers were being given, they believed that the God, some, the spirit being, would come in through the mouth and take residence up in this thing, literally possessing it. And now they believed it was truly the image of the God believing that the God lived inside of it now, and as they looked at it, they could see a physical representation of the spirit God that was living inside of it. Now it would be placed in the temple, 
and now people would worship before it. The second thing that was called an image of God in the ancient world was a king. Kings were thought to be images or sons of God. We know that at their coronation ceremony, when a king was being coronated into the, the royal um, uh, stat standing, now he was becoming, taking the, the, the scepter and the crown from the last king, that at that coronation ceremony, they believed that the God, whatever God they worshipped in their country, would come upon them and in them, literally possessing them, in a sense, so that now they weren't just a human being, they were also a living God, and the people would worship them. This is why, for example, Pharaoh was worshipped in Egypt, and why the emperor was worshipped at Rome. They believed that their gods literally rested upon and within their king. Here's the unique thing now. Let's, with that in mind, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, because here the true God, the creator of all things, says this about his image. Let us create humankind in our image, according to our likeness. And so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is a stunning text from the ancient world's perspective, because in the ancient world is either a stone statue or the king who is created or seen to be the image of God. The true God says, no, it is every human being. Not just the elite king, not some lifeless statue in a temple. Every human being is created to be the image of God. And not just males, which would have been very easy to say in an ancient patriarchal culture. No, male and female, created in the very image of God. No other ancient creation text of all the cultures around Israel talks this way about the dignity and value and worth of all human beings. From the highest ranks to what we would consider in society the lowest ranks, God doesn't see it that way. All are created to be images of his true triune nature. We know this because of the detailed description that we're given in the very next chapter of the Bible. Here we see how God creates his image that he talked about in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 2, we're told this. Out of the ground, the word in Hebrew, Adamah, out of the ground, the Adamah, God takes dust or dirt and he fashions this, this body, this human being. And then it says, and once God had created out of the dust or the, the dirt of the ground, uh, this human, he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, God's very spirit. It's exactly what would happen in the other cultures, only they would breathe it into a stone statue, the mouthwashing ceremony. This God, he doesn't have precious metals and jewels. He takes dirt. But when he breathes, he breathes life. No stone statue ever came alive in those temples of the, of the other pagan religions. This God just in dust of the earth in his breath brings a living creature into being, a human being. Now, interestingly, he calls this human Adam. We, we say Adam, the, the first name of the first person. But the Hebrew word there, Adam, literally is just the, 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 the Hebrew name for human being. It's literally God creates human being. Out of the dust of the ground, breathing into his nostrils, and the human becomes a living creature. Now God says, or the text says that God then takes Adam, Adam, and places him in a garden. Now we often miss this because we're not familiar with temple language from the ancient world. But in the ancient world, temples were always uh, put in the midst of a garden. And in that garden there would be, there'd be a water source, a river nearby, or some sort of, some, some irrigation. Well, we find the very same thing in Eden, right? We have a garden with four rivers and plants and uh, fruit available. This is temple language. In other words, when God takes his image, a living human, and puts him in his temple, his temple's not a building. It's, it's the earth. 
It's this beautiful garden created for his image to live in. Ancient people would have seen this as an amazing statement that all humans are God's images to be living in God's garden in a blessed place of relationship. Now, why does God do all this? What does love have to do with this? Now we're coming to covenant relationship. As soon as God has Adam in the garden, he says this to Adam. I want you to do two things. I want you to cultivate and guard the garden. Cultivate and guard. We sometimes translate it cultivate and keep. Uh, the word keep is often the word there that we translate uh, Hebrew shamar for. I'd propose a better translation is guard. Uh, that word, the word guard is clearly the right translation a chapter later in chapter 3 where the angels, the cherubim, are, are told to shamar the way to the tree of life. There we translate it guard. I think we should translate it guard here as well. Adam is to guard and cultivate the garden. Care for the garden, have it be flourishing, and keep it protected. Why? Well, we find out in chapter 3 who he's supposed to guard from. There's a serpent who has nothing but lies. And we'll see that Adam doesn't do a great job of guarding there. But that was his task, to, to cultivate, to care for, and to guard the garden. And then God says, Adam, human, there's two trees in the center of this garden. Tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll be talking about these two trees a little later in another session. But he puts these two trees in the center of the garden. He says to Adam, from the tree of life you may freely eat. That's there for you. Life in abundance. But listen, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of this tree. For in the day that you eat of this tree, you'll die. So please, please, I've just given you life. Don't commit suicide, God is basically saying. Do not eat of that tree. Now this raises a lot of questions. What's so bad about the knowledge of good and evil? Why did God put that tree there in the garden if he didn't want him to eat of it? A lot of interesting questions, and we'll come to those when we talk about the creation covenant a little bit later. At this point, I just want us to see that God is doing a covenant here. There's a choice that has to be made. The choice of love for God looks like eating from the tree of life and not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Covenant breaking would be to do what God's asked them not to do. Only one term to this covenant, don't eat of the tree. And God says, and if you do, death will come. See, death, death is always a part of covenant breaking. So God, as soon as he has a human, literally the very next thing we hear is God has a little covenant with this human. Here's what I'm asking of you. Here's how to live life well. Here's what to avoid so that death will not be part of the story. Now go and simply live in relationship with me. In other words, as soon as God has his image, he enters into a covenant relationship with this human, this image. But God's not done there. As soon as he's finished that covenant between him and Adam, he then turns to Adam and says, you know, it's not good that you're alone. It is not good for the man to be alone. Chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis. Now, I think we have to stop there because those words, not good, should just leap off the page to us. Here's why. All through Genesis chapter 1, every time God does something, the text says that God said it was good. God's doing good things, right? He's creating the sun, moon, and stars. He's creating land and sea. He's creating birds to fill this, the air, sea creatures to fill the oceans, and land animals and humans to fill the earth, right? And everything, it's, it's either good or good or the last day. God just says, it's very good. So we should be stopping in our tracks to hear the words in chapter 218, it's not good. But listen, it's not that God hasn't done something that's not good. It's that something's not complete yet. God's not finished. He looks at that single human being who he's now in covenant with and says, now there's something not right about that scenario. And here's what God says is not right. He shouldn't be alone. Now the text goes on and says that God then brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would name them, to see if there's a, a suitable helper, a partner for him. All the animals come by one by one, and Adam's giving them names. 
But it's interesting, at the end of that episode, it says that uh, even though all the animals walked by and were named by Adam, no one of them was suitable as a partner for him. God then steps in, and it says that he put Adam in a deep sleep. Now, whenever you hear God, particularly in the book of Genesis, putting someone in a deep sleep, be ready for something covenantal to happen. This happens to Adam here, and God does a cool covenant. In a few chapters, God will put Abraham in a deep sleep. And again, a beautiful covenant thing happens. I think the picture we have here is God just lets us rest while he takes care of our covenants. He puts Adam to sleep. The first human surgery happens. And out of the rib, out of his side, a piece is taken and a woman, literally means out of man, is fashioned. And the text says that, that God brought her, brought her to the man, and his response is, ah, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now what's interesting there is that language of bone and flesh is covenantal language. It's one way of talking about people who've become covenanted family members. So the point is this, as soon as God has his image, what he does is he puts them into covenant with himself and covenant with each other. He takes the one and out of the one pulls a second one, man and woman, and then turns them to face each other and puts them back into covenant relationships. So the one became two to become one. Only now this oneness is a unity of two persons. A one flesh relationship, the text calls it in verse 24. It almost seems as if, as soon as God says, the God of love, the God of triune personal love, Father, Son, and Spirit, says, I must create my image. What he does is he creates a person, a human who can love God, and then creates the two to love each other. In other words, love is at the very center of what it means to be human. Now we're getting some clarity why Jesus puts love as the central commandment. Love is at the center of who God is and is at the center of what human beings are created to do. When God thinks human, he thinks my image. And when he thinks his image, he thinks one who is in covenant with me and in covenant with each other. And here's the thing. Just one chapter later, chapter 3, we talk, uh, we hear about a serpent and we'll, we'll get to this in more detail later. But we, talk, we hear about a serpent who comes into this garden, this beautiful temple of God, and with a couple of lies, undoes the very covenantal relationship between them and God and them and each other and them and creation. God has an enemy. That enemy hates love because God is love. And that enemy looks for nothing but to destroy relationship. We'll be getting to talk about chapter 3 in spiritual warfare in another session. At this point, we simply can conclude that love is at the center because love is at the center of God and the center of what humans are called for. And what humans are called for and to is love relationship through covenant.